Hi, I'm Coach Corey Wayne, and today we're going to discuss an interesting topic called the Hegelian dialectic. And this is something that it's like an, another version, I guess, of the divide and conquer strategy that Sun Tzu and probably for thousands of years before him, other military people discussed. Divide and conquer is basically you get people arguing and fighting amongst each other. And then the people that are benefit is what's the outcome of those particular conflicts. And so while people are arguing over things and while there's lots of conflict over different things, the elite, the politicians, the backroom deals can basically happen. And so we've got a a clip from, this is from, I believe, the either late 70s, early 1980s with Anthony Sutton, and where he talks about how it is used, because how we kind of on this, this topic was, I mean, I think everybody that's watching this recognizes that there's a lot of conflict in the world right now. There's a lot of friction in society, and you hear people talking about, oh, it's social media that's creating the problem and that's why everybody's arguing. But at the end of the day, while all of us are arguing over different things, left versus right, typically divide and conquer. So while we're arguing about kind of trivial things a lot of times, and what's interesting is you'll notice stories will hit that look bad for politicians or people in government. And then there'll be something else that'll come up and then that will dominate the news cycle different things with wars or like now all of a sudden everybody's paying attention to what Johnny Depp and Amber Heard are doing or some big news will mm -hmm. drop and then something else will come that's even more outrageous and then it distracts everybody's attention and then you end up looking at something else and so you you look at because obviously you get to be my age I'm 52 now and so I've been through a lot of things in the last few decades and you see a lot of the same things happen over and over a lot Lots of wars, lots of conflict, different things going on in the news. And then you wonder, it's like, what what is the cause of all of this? What's the cause of all the friction? Like, what's the cause behind the Russia and the Ukraine conflict? Or what's going on in the Middle East and has been going on in the, in the Middle East? There's always, it's polarity consciousness. It's always us versus them. There's always some kind of us versus them. And so as we... We go into this because we're trying to figure out like what's what's going on in the world. Like right now, one of the things that everybody's talking about is this abortion thing leaked. You know, there was stuff that was in the news about inflation and gas prices and all stuff that people aren't happy about. And then all of a sudden, we're talking about the abortion debate, and now yeah. that's front and center. And so everything else we were talking about before the war in Ukraine, all these other things, that has kind of taken it back back seat to now the abortion is because yeah. this with something that's never happened before but a opinion on the roe Ro versus wade in a new case that the supreme court i guess is going to rule on here soon or put out their it, it's like a advanced copy got leaked yeah. conveniently in the media and that just completely changed the whole conversation so for the last week and a half, it's like all everybody's been talking about the news is the abortion thing. It's crazy how quickly people forget as well, too. Just the thing going on previously. <laughs> yeah, these, co these conflicts are great distractions. That's the, They're pure, just great distractions. Everyone's focused on that. No one's... It's like the Colosseum, the bread in a circus. Yes. We keep, keep the little people entertained with trivial things that That's, keep them yeah. occupied. Meanwhile, other laws and things... Are happening. I mean, we just, there's another what was a thirty something billion. I think it got yeah. approved for the war that's that's going on over there. And I mean, it's just interesting how when we need things like finishing the wall, right? What did Trump want? Like three billion dollars, I think, to do the wall. We couldn't come up with that money, but right away we got plenty of money to help Ukraine out. It's like we're willing to help other countries, but. It's it's we always get like the short end of the stick. Or yeah. you look at the the bailouts and the um, the infrastructure deal that happened. I mean, it was, I think it was close to a trillion dollars, whatever it was. And I, I saw somewhere it was like twenty thirty percent actually goes to infrastructure. The rest is just a, a bunch of rewards for their biggest campaign con contributors. 
and other pet projects of the politicians. And so the people get very little infrastructure and three times 75% of the money is going to other pet causes of the politicians yeah. and the lawyers and lobbyists for the big corporations. It's public losses, private gains, essentially. Yeah, public socialism for the big corporations yeah and the interesting thing is like when you look at it, like because you hear about fascism all the time and everybody's people on the right typically get called trump is a fascist and this and that and it's like fascism according to mussolini and he would know because he kind of created it was he said fascism is a perfect merger of state and corporate interests and so you hear a lot because we did a video on the world economic forum and you hear a lot about public private partnerships so it's basically the state and the corporations in cahoots with one another. I mean, that's technically the... the Which is a fancy name yeah, for it. Yeah, that's, def- that's technically fascism. When you have the global elites who like to refer to themselves as the global elites, and they benefit from the conflict that's happening. So from dictionary.com, the Hegel- Hegelian dialectic, I still have a hard time pronouncing it, it is an interpretive method originally used to relate specific entities or events to the absolute idea in which some assertable proposition, thesis, is necessarily opposed by an equally assertable and apparently contradictory proposition, antithesis. The mutual contradiction being reconciled on a higher level of truth by a third proposition, which is synthesis. So it's like you, you cause a problem, basically. It's like you have two polarized forces, and then the solution comes in. And so you look at what's happening. I mean, there's following what's going on in Ukraine. It looks like Russia potentially might even lose this war because and you even see them talking about in their talk shows that they're, the people on Russian TV are talking about how they're – they're using older equipment, and as they continue to send equipment to replace their losses, they're sending the older things because the newer things, their best technology and weapons, has gotten destroyed. Yeah. And they're they're recognizing that they're not able to go up against NATO's top tier weapons platforms, and so there's the the real possibility that Russia there there's like a disorganized retreat, if you will, if things keep happening and keep going in the same trends the way they are and the replacements that they're bringing in are less experienced and plus they're coming in with older equipment and so it's it's pretty fascinating like so who's going to benefit obviously the defense industry is going to do phenomenally well which i mean as an american you want to know that your 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 team in essence has the best weapons and i'm all for that but Bottom line is they're going to make a lot of money and it ain't looking good for Putin. And so then the speculation is what's going to happen to Putin. If he loses, can you imagine yeah. if he loses this war and loses a big chunk of his army? I think when they invaded, they had something like 120 BTGs, battalion tactical groups, I think are 800 to 1200 men each. And the last I saw, there was somewhere around 80. Yeah. So you're talking about 25, 30% of their military strength that they send there has been obliterated basically and so you got replacements that have gone in there that are less experienced you got older armor and weapons and so we've got we got a clip that we're going to go through we're going to play a little bit of it and this like i said this is from anthony sutton's interview that he gave like i said this is going back to late 70s early 80s and so we got well, actually before we get to that clip we've got another um, to go a little bit more in the Hegelian dialectic. And those kind of give some context when you watch right. this video clip that we're going to go through. And so, Chunky, why don't oh, wait, you... I have something to say for the read. thing. Go ahead. Um, going back to um, with the war and conflict, they're also... It's very profitable. You can... Uh, it's easy to... from You can see it through the war industry. That's profitable that way. But also, by putting in these new regimes, you control... Who gets put in power? Who gets to control these new resources? So it's a very, it's a very big power move. It works on a lot of levels. It works as a distraction, but at the same time, you can profit from it. So you can do your own things on the side in the shadows. It's like you got the global elite. This is just another in their little 
It's like they're playing a big from, fucking game of risk. Yeah, well, it's like you got the <laughs> Russian elite fighting the Western elite. You got the Ukrainian elite. You you know, so you've got all these different groups of people jockeying for power. And I'm sure there's a lot of members of the elite in Russia because they've been damaged financially. They would love to see Vladimir Putin not be in power anymore. And there was an, uh, uh, one of the guys that used to run, I guess, one of the big oil or gas companies. He just died under unusual circumstances mm. this, this past weekend. And so it's amazing. Suicide with He's three bullet heads in the back of <laughs> Yeah, there's, there were several of them that was like murder-suicide. There were two of them, I think, a week and a half, two weeks ago, or murder-suicide. And the one that just died over the weekend, his, um, I guess his company had spoken out against the the war, yeah. you know, because they're, they're Russians. So they were against, not everybody in Russia is, is for the war. Obviously, a lot of people are because they've been propagandized, but their special operation has not gone according to plan with the help of obviously people. Oh yeah. I forgot. This isn't a war. This is a special operation. Yeah. That's what he classifies as special operation, but it is not going well for Putin. All right. Let's get into. So why don't you go? So Chunky's going to go through, this is another definition that goes into detail on the Hegelian dialectic. And uh, you may recognize some of these, these terms. So the Hegelian dialectic can be broken down into this basic three concepts of problem, reaction, and solution. So it's kind of like you, oh, there's this problem. You can either provide it or exist. Did they cause? Yeah. Typically, most cases they cause, but the problem could just pre-exist in nature. And then you have or everyone react to it. Everyone's like, oh, we have to fix this problem. It's like, oh, don't you worry. We have this magical solution already. We have everything already worked out. All the logistics, all the legwork. Boom. Solution. And nine, every time that solution tends to benefit the people who proposed it in mysterious ways. Number one, the government creates or it exploits a problem which it attributes blame to others. The second step is that the people react by asking the government for protection and help, essentially safety and security, to help solve the problem. Number three, then the government offers a solution that was planned long before the crisis occurred. So remember, there was a, um, uh, who was it, Thomas Jefferson or Benjamin Franklin talked about that, where people give up a little freedom for safety and security, and eventually it's just, there's constant, oh, we got this problem, hey, but you'll be safer, okay, well, just give up a little bit of your freedom, hey, let us, you know, spy on your devices, hey, let us record everything that the speaker picks up or the microphone picks up without your knowing, and then we'll go to the FISA court and then we'll get permission to, uh, what are they, what's, what's the word for that? Unmask, to unmask you. And then listen to your things that were already recorded. Because yeah. obviously when you listen to whatever Snowden said, then you kind of see what happened. Well, the line the lines of what Thomas Jefferson said, I quote, he says, anybody who gives up liberty and freedom for safety and security deserves neither. And will lose both. Yeah, this doesn't, that's Doesn't it. deserve either, yeah. Good job. Young Abe Lincoln comes through with the quote. And we'll get into this later. The method they use is that of the Hegelian dialectic. Thesis played against antithesis leads to a synthesis. In other words, for Hegel, for history to make progress, you have to have conflict. Yeah, I find that actually really, really interesting. The only way for progress is through conflict and destruction, kind of throwing it into the furnace well, to recreate. Well, it's like Rahm, like we were talking about earlier, Rahm Emanuel. Uh, years ago, you see the video of it. He said, never let a good crisis go to waste because then you could accomplish things you wouldn't normally be able to do under normal circumstances. Yeah. Like the WEF guys, they all talk about that, how we can manage conflict. They, You know, the Great Reset. Uh, using what happened with COVID and the lockdowns to reset society. And because you're under an emergency, a global emergency, basically, you're able to get things done and you're able to get people to give up their civil liberties in order to be safe. You're going to save me from the virus. And now all the stuff that's coming out, even Bill Gates was talking about the other day, how oh we the, the, all the school lockdowns well we've set our kids back like a couple of years and turns out I mean he's openly talking about this on video now less just in the last week alone that 
it, it was a mistake to lock all the kids and keep them at home. That didn't really stop the spread of the virus or anything. It's like a year ago, you could say that and talk about it and you get banned. You get deplatformed. And so a year and a half ago, people were talking about this was this was known early on into all the lockdowns, but you weren't allowed to talk about it. Yeah. And now here he is openly admitting it. And then he's now he's got a new book he's schlepping. He's like, I have this new book, how we can avoid all these problems in the next pandemic, which I, I haven't read it, but I'm sure it'll probably be something along the lines of giving him and his friends more power to control. And because he also has come out and said the way Australia and New Zealand and those countries locked down was the best way to do it. So next time around, he wants every, he's going to expect everybody like, to give up even more. Yeah liberties and freedoms and be locked down even Just longer treating everyone like children it's exactly. not like a no one sensible adults that can't yeah. make their own judgments yeah. it's like no no you're gonna you're going to time out you're going to your little kitty pen okay it's insane it's just these people who just want that management and control they think they're the only ones capable when you throughout the huge human history the last hundred thousand years humans have been very self-sufficient and individuals have been living on their own because their own Adults, they can make their own decisions. They don't need a nanny government, a nanny person watching over them and making all the decisions for them. They're capable of making the decisions. There are a lot. Their ancestors did it. That they're they're living proof. They know how to survive and make it. They don't need someone else making all these decisions for them. Well, it's like the when you he was talking about Bush. So I assume he's talking about Bush Senior because again, this is I around, think that's the next. Section. Well, you want to play it and well, then we'll, we'll talk about the this Bush. this particular clip. You know, he was talking about George Bush in there. But it was George Bush Sr. because he was the vice president during Reagan. But, I mean, back in 2001, September 11th, after the attack happened, then it was all about, hey, we got a, the Patriot Act, right? You got to give up access to your phone records, to P.O. boxes. And so it was a way for everybody to go, hey, we're going to keep you safe. We've got to monitor the phone lines because these terrorists are using our own phone lines and Internet and things against us. So we need you to give up more of your security and your individualism and privacy so we can record everything. And then we'll go to the FISA court and say, we think these people are, it's only for foreign people. The FISA was foreign surveillance. So it was basically people outside the com- country that were in contact with people on the inside mm. of the country. And so by unmasking the people outside the country, they'd be able to figure out who on inside of the country was talking to them. And then at the end of the day, people at the time said, this is going to be abused. And they said, you're either with us or you're with the terrorists. I remember that Bush made a, a big deal out of that. And so because of that problem, because of the, of the attacks of September 11th, it's like we had to take off our shoes. We still have to take off our shoes. We have to, I mean, in the old days, I remember in the nineties when we travel, you just, we book a ticket. I remember I was in Hawaii with my best friend. We're like, hey, let's go to Maui. I was like, cool. We're like, look, let's see where flights are. We looked and like two hours later, then we hauled ass to the airport. And you could get there 30 minutes, 45 minutes before the plane took off. You just walk through a metal detector and that's it. Yeah. And now it's like a two hour. You got to get there two, three hours for your flight and go through all this stuff, like kind of going through a Disney line where you get, you get lit up with um, – all kinds of zoomies and stuff to yeah. see that you don't have anything on you. And it's like that, that shit never went away. And that was the argument they made 20 years ago. This stuff is never going to go away. Yeah. It doesn't go. It but only progresses. My best friend and I, we showed up at the airport like 20, 30 minutes before we took off. Just, you know, we were running through the airport, walked through the metal detector. There's no lines, no nothing. You just go and you sit down at the gate. The only line was as people were, were getting on the plane and that was it. And then you're, you take off. And, and now it's a, it's a big, huge ordeal. You just can't travel as easily and effortlessly as you did before September 11th and the Patriot Act and all that stuff. And so, because the argument is always, hey, we got this problem. We, but hey, there's this solution. You'll just have to give up some more of your your freedom and your your privacy and your, your self autonomy is gone. But yeah. hey, it's for your own self interest. We're working for you. We're gonna protect you. Yeah, we keep you safe. So now we'll continue on here in our little journey. And if you look at the writings, for example, of the Trilateral Commission, they talk openly in the Trilateral Commission about managing conflict, not solving conflicts, but managing, managing conflicts. conflicts. 
conflict management. That's the that's the uh, that's the crime. So they got the profit, the power, and the management. Mm -hmm. Where do they want to steer history through the Bolshevik Revolution? They wanted to set up, and they did, the two opposing forces. Out of that came World War Two. So we're gonna we got Mika. So they and then we're gonna talk about. So it's Mika and her husband, and you know who this guy is. That's Donald Trump. No, we go back to that. So remember, when he was running, what I found interesting about this is that when he was running, they loved him. They loved having him on. They were fangirling Trump. But as soon as he won the nomination, their attitude completely changed, and then they just went after him and started attacking him. And so the thing that is an interesting connection is you look at um, Mika, who we have here. Um, she's obviously a very attractive woman. So you've got her, and who was her father? Her father was Zygbenu Brzezinski. I can't pronounce his name right. But he started the Trilateral Commission for David Rockefeller of the, the Rockefeller family. And so what Anthony was just talking about in that clip that we just watched was how the Trilateral Commission, even in their documents, is talk, talks about managing conflict. Not solving it, but managing it. Because the Hegelian di dialectic is, you know, divide and conquer. Keep, keep everybody arguing amongst one another. And so he was in the Carter administration and so you've got the rockefeller family and these other elite you listen to like klaus schwab and the world economic forum it's all this the davos crowd all the same groups of people that feel like they're the masters of the universe and should be running everything and you you hear um klaus schwab talk about how they can manage conflict or they can manage crisis in order to get an outcome that they want and so obviously we got David Rockefeller here who at the time his grandfather, he was one of the grandkids of the original Rockefeller, which was with Standard Oil and basically every major oil company, Chase Manhattan Bank, all originated and much of the pharmaceutical industry, by the way, all originated from the Rockefeller family. And so you got this guy forming the trilateral commission which has in their own literature talks about managing conflict that you you got managing crises basically to achieve an outcome that you want which is always more and more power concentrated in themselves and so when you look at the daughter of the guy that started the trilateral commission mika and you got her now husband, who was supposedly a Republican, Jim Joe Scarborough. And during the election, they loved Trump when he was running. They were excited that he was running. But man, as soon as he won the nomination, completely changed and they absolutely hated him. He was a racist, he's this, that. And, and you go, how contrived is that? They loved him until they won the, he won the nomination. And then it was, they have, even since, they've done everything they can to try to discredit him. And you look at that and you go, isn't that unusual? They cheerlead to get the guy in there. Even Hillary was cheerleading for Donald Trump because she felt that she could beat him. And obviously she was wrong. But you just find it interesting, all these connections. It's like they're the elite, they're kids. They work in, I mean, she works for MSNBC, her husband, who supposedly was a Republican. He was one of those rhino types. He's always been kind of a, a Marxist type of, of dude that, believes in more control by the government. But you just see these kinds of connections and and it's interesting. I mean, you remember, the, the you know, after September 11th, then we went in Afghanistan and then it was, we got to go after Iraq. They got weapons of mass destruction, which turned out there were some weapons of mass destruction, but there wasn't very many of them left. There wasn't giant warehouses full of stockpiles and... But that was justification for going in because he might use them or give them to terrorists and they might blow up one of our, our cities. And then, you know, come to find out all these years later that he, he had mostly given up. And I, I wrote about this in Mastering Yourself, which you can read for free 
on my website. But I mean, as a self-reliant human being, you got to kind of know and understand what goes on in the world and how things affect you and how policy gets decided. And you can kind of see the people that are involved. They have their their view of the way the world needs to be. And just like the video that the interview with Anthony Sutton talking about them. It's just interesting how we haven't talked about that in forever. And then now all of a sudden it's the only thing that everybody's talking yeah. about because this thing, something that's never, ever happened. You have an opinion that the Supreme court is writing one of the drafts of it. Somebody in there released it to the public, released it to the, the journalists basically. And so what happened? Now you got the left and the right yelling at each other. I just saw a video over the weekend, a bunch of, I don't know, eight or ten people dressed up in like the handmaiden's tail kind of thing. Goes into this big giant Catholic church with signs and stuff and right in the middle of mass trying to dis- yeah. disrupt it. And they all got escorted out because they weren't having it. But this is the stuff that ends up on the news at night. And so we're all yelling left and right versus abortion, pro-abortion, pro-choice and all this stuff going back and forth. Meanwhile... It comp- if you look at just what were we talking about two or three weeks ago? Talking about the Ukraine war? What else were we talking about? Amber Inflation. Heard. Elon Musk. Elon Musk. T- you know, Twitter. Um, but the, the big thing that was in the news that everybody was talking about was Joe Biden's low poll numbers and how it looks oh, bad the for the Democrats. The Hunter Biden laptop resurfaced because it's – you know, the, uh, the, the Durham investigation quickly. is still ongoing and st- stuff is coming out. And now Durham has given somebody uh, that worked at, I think it was, was a Fusion GPS? It gave him immunity, I think it was. Not, maybe it wasn't Fusion. It was one of the companies that was involved. Um, gave, it was a woman and she was given, um, I think it was one of the tech firms or something. I can't, I can't remember. But she was given immunity to testify against her bosses because she was basically saying, hey, I'm, she didn't want to incriminate herself. So they said, okay. We become a witness and you just tell us what happened. So they're obviously going after the big fish, but like we talked about a while back and some of all that Durham stuff, it's like by the time this stuff works its way through the court system and people get charged and prosecuted, it's going to be another five, 10 years down the road. And by then most of the people involved will, will have either died or ridden, ridden off into the sunset. And I mean, 15 years, 10, 15 years after the events happened, There'll be a completely different president 10, 15 years. Yeah. We won't be talking about this. The people anymore. won't even know what happened. They're like, what is that event? They don't even remember. Hunter Biden it's, laptop. Who is that? It's just so Hunter quickly Biden? spun out the stuff. No, there's no collective memory of it. It's just past. It's so cyclical. It just comes around. It's kind of, I don't, I can't fathom the people that are constantly paying attention to the news. I think it's very sadistic. You have to be a really sadistic, sick person to constantly just be consuming all this stuff because it really warps your whole worldview of everything. It's really effective at manipulating people. But I don't know. whenever something is a big story that looks bad for the people in power, just notice how there's always something that, that just comes out of left field. Like when Trump was running for president. Remember, I remember two, three months before the election, and he was, he was killing it, and he was looking good. And then all that stuff came out with the, uh, the tape, you know, the grab by the gr- pussy yeah. tape and, you know, Access Hollywood, I think it was. And so that's what everybody's talking about. And then the people, the Republicans are like, oh, you got to resign. That's just way over the line. And, and I talked about some videos at the time that I did. And that was the only time he apologized. He said he apologized to his wife for that. Because obviously it, it didn't sound good. Because he was married at the time. He was, yeah. he was with Melania. And but so his apology had value because it was the only time he ever apologized about anything. And scarcity creates value. Yeah. And so everybody's calling for him to resign but it completely changed the conversation just like the russia thing oh trump might be a manchurian candidate he putin's back in trump he he's he's where i don't what does putin have on trump Remember, it was all over the news and then that that just hamstrung him through then you had the Mueller investigation i mean and then just seeing how all that stuff it was just dirty tricks of hillary clinton's yeah. campaign and it's that's how this stuff works. It comes at you so fast. It's, everybody's talking about abortion right now, but two, three weeks from now, n- n- other news comes out that's bad for the administration. It, it'll, they'll distract us with something else. You got to pay attention to the Hegelian dialectic. It's out of the conflict. What what happens? And a good example that we see of this, and I definitely want to make sure we have this in there. 
but it's like is the the gun debate. And so what you hear all the time is that we've got a gun violence epidemic and we need to do something about it, even though there's more laws in the books that regulate guns than pretty much any other thing in our society, maybe other than healthcare. I mean, was, but I mean, guns is one of, there's like over 10,000 laws, I think it is. I mean, it's just an absolutely absurd amount of laws in the book. It's impossible for any one person to even know what the laws are when it comes to these things. But what you look at it is it's very simple to solve the problem. Anybody that's been in law enforcement, it's like there's always a small group of people that are committing the majority of the crimes. And so when you look at, um, like we were talking about earlier, like there was a video that came out, I don't know, a few months back, where there was like five or six people in a neighborhood. It was somewhere in Chicago. And then two or three cars show up, and out of each car gets two or three dudes with guns, and they just start shooting at each other so you got like a dozen people oh broad day like one woman i think it was part of the gang she's got a kid she ends up getting shot i think she later died but these people are shooting at each other and then the, the guys hop in their cars and they leave and i think some of the guys took off after them but these are the kinds of things that become mass shootings or whatever and then they they do nothing about it it's like they allow the problem to continue to fester when they, they know who these gang members are, they know the people that are committing the crimes, but under criminal justice reform, they never stay in jail long enough. So they're constantly going in, and then they're coming right back out, and they go right back to committing the crime. So you don't lock the criminals up that are doing the gun crime, and then the politicians on the, the Democrat side can just keep going, hey, we got this, we need common sense gun laws, we got this gun violence epidemic, we got to do something about it. But those where you look at all the major gun crime, it's always in Democrat controlled cities and it's it's mass shootings, all that stuff. It's, it's just gang violence and it's just allowed to fester and they do nothing about it. And then the politicians that are running their seats go, oh, it's all the lax gun laws in the other states. That's that's why gun violence is out of hand. Well, if that were, were true, then we would have the same kind of gun violence everywhere. But the fact that these problems are allowed to fester, it's like they don't want to solve them. It's pretty obvious. Yeah, it, they could just lock these people up that are committing the crimes and then they wouldn't be out committing the crimes anymore because law-abiding citizens are not out getting in gun battles you know, with 10 or 15 people. It's just not happening. Yeah, it's not And so if the politicians aren't locking the people up that are committing the crimes and you got different NGOs, non-governmental uh, organizations putting money into different things to get different policies, to get politicians elected. You look at like Gascon in L.A., You've got, you look at Chicago, you had New York, you got Seattle, you get these people that lean far left, they're all about criminal justice, and then so they coddle criminals and they just never arrest them. And they just leave them back out in the street. And so the, the problem just continues to fester. And the politicians go, oh, there's nothing we can do about it. If, we, if you allow us to do this and vote for us to do this, then we'll definitely be able to solve the problem. And so, it, I mean... So the gun violence or like the school shootings, these things are allowed to happen. Like we, we talked about earlier with the guy that shot up Stoneman, Stoneman Douglas. The, the police had been to that kid's house like over 30 times. And he'd been threatening to shoot up the school back when he used to go there. And so the day that the shooting was happening, a lot of the kids said, oh, I bet it's so-and-so. And it turned out they were right because he'd been telling them for years that he was going to do it. And... Under the, uh, was it Obama era policy where they were trying to keep kids that were committing crimes in, in schools from getting a record and then having their lives ruined, which would, you know, then they become adults, they eventually end up in jail. And so you end up coddling people like this kid that became the mass shooter and he should have never passed a background check. But yet, because nothing was ever recorded on his record, he went and he passed his background check and then did what he'd been saying for two, three years he was going to do. And then the, what was his name? Sheriff Scott Israel goes on TV and says, oh, and has this big town hall with CNN. Well, we just, if we just ban these guns and you got these gullible kids in high school that don't know nothing like the, the, uh, who's, who's the guy He goes to Harvard, the spaghetti arm dude. You know what I'm talking about? He's he's a very anti-gun. He's very vocal. He, I can't remember his name, but he's very vocal. He's on Twitter all the time, you know, talking about gun. And he wasn't even there that day at the school. So, 
but he just his solution, of course, because he's a, a lefty, is just ban the guns, and they'll solve the problem. And so they just allow these problems to continue to fester. The, 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 you create policies that allow people like the Stoneman Douglas shooter and the people in the gangs that are committing the violence to stay on the street and keep committing crimes. Or in the Sto- Stoneman D- Douglas um, shooting, you let you create the condition where that kid slips through the cracks and then goes and does what he says he's going to do all, all along. And then, you know, our, the sheriff, Brown County Sheriff goes on TV and says, Oh yeah, it's the lax gun laws. Those are the problems. It's not his own incompetence, which obviously it was. That's why he got removed by governor DeSantis, he got fired. And then he eventually ran for reelection and he lost, which was nice. But it's like incompetent people like that that are just kind of rubes in the system. They they're just cogs in the big gears that you know they watch the the television programming, the stuff that people like Minka and other people in the media. It's you got politicians watching the news and they get influenced by this stuff and it influences their thinking. And the big problem in our country is too many people believe that the news is real, and our our politicians all the way down to this state and local level are influenced by news that nine times out of 10 is inaccurate, missing information or straight out misinformation. 